Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So first off, let's admit it. I have uh, researched some really bizarre cases on this channel. I have uh, looked at some real depravities in life and the things that people will do to each other to seek revenge and things that people will do to win at all costs. And, well, they see it as winning, but today we got a case. It uh, starts in New York and has parts of it that are in Kansas and another part of it is from Texas. And it's all over something that was completely blown out of proportion by one side of the group and it was going down a path of destruction long before these events ever happened it was going to happen something it, the, the you know the fuse to the powder keg had been lit lit and it was going to explode Everybody from the outside looking in on this case was like, it's going to happen. Something is going to happen. And everybody knew it. So, let's get into it. All right. So, like I said, this case starts in um, Sodus, uh, New York, a small town resting on the up against the Lake Ontario area. A small community where no one locks their doors uh, neighbors know each other it's a small uh, bedroom community uh, where still people still greet each other with hello uh, gentlemen you know tip uh, a hat to you know the ladies as they come in and out and people hold a door open for each other on october 22nd 2008 joshua niles um, it could have been seen and was seen by several of his neighbors to having a conversation in the front yard of his home next to the driveway while he was unloading a um, his pickup truck, a Ford F-150, not that that matters. But he was talking to a gentleman who was wearing a hoodie sweatshirt. Several neighbors said that they couldn't see him, uh, the uh, individual's face. They knew he was white because they could see his hands, but the gentleman had his hoodie up, and this is in, you know, October, so you know, it was a little bit cool at this time of the day, but they could not uh, um, figure out who this gentleman was, and they didn't rec necessarily recognize the voice that they could hear. They could all hear this gentleman's voice. So he was having a conversation with him. While his 24 year Josh was uh, um, Niles' girlfriend, 24-year-old Amber um, Washburn, was uh, sitting in her car and uh, getting ready. She was waiting for, for Joshua to finish unloading the truck you know, and grab a couple of things, and they were obviously getting ready to leave. She was sitting in the car with uh, his um, infant child in the back seat strapped in. Several neighbors, included, including um, neighbor uh, Tiffany Thayer, said that uh, she could see the two men talking, but uh, that uh, as she glanced out the window, she was caring for her two-year-old son at the time, she was glancing out her kitchen window at the time, and she could see the driveway and then the grass and the trees, but the, the driveway that she could see would belong to her uh, neighbor, Joshua Niles. She said she could see them, you know, having a conversation, and then it started to get louder and louder. So she knew that the two gentlemen were having a disagreement. But before long, as she said that she was reaching for in their cabinet to get a, a snack for her son, who was two years old at the time, like I said, she heard a loud bang, and then a pause, and then a bang, and then another pause, and then a bang, bang, again. Another neighbor um, testified, along with uh, Tiffany Thayer, that after the first bang, she looked out the window, and the other neighbor looked out the window as well, and they could see uh, Niles, Joshua Niles grab his chest and hold both his hands across his chest like this, and then fall to his knees while the gentleman in the hoodie stood over him. 
Then Joshua now stouts at the ground and start to crawl towards his truck. Hit the try to try to crawl underneath his truck while all the line time screaming out in agony for Amber uh, Washburn, his girlfriend, to help him. Help him. Both of the neighbors uh, testified in the case that that is what they, they had seen. It, uh, um, Mrs. Thayer said, went on and said, um, this is an exact quote, it was really hard to believe what I had just heard and seen. When a man wearing the hoodie turned towards uh, um, towards me I and towards uh, Amber in the driver's seat of the car, I caught a, a clear view of his face as he fired the gun again. Before the shooter calmly uh, turned and walked away, the other neighbors said that they caught a side profile of the uh, as the assailant as that he just calmly walked away to a car, got in, and drove away. So, when police arrived at this at this shooting, um, they did find the unarmed uh, infant still in the car seat of uh, Amber Washburn's car. The infant um, and another minor child who wasn't there at the time uh, turned out to be the motive behind this shooting. In August 2018, full custody was awarded to Joshua Niles of both the infant and the uh, second child. According to authorities, Joshua Niles' ex-girlfriend, Charlene Childs, or Childress, age 25, not, was uh, living in Texas uh, at, at this point with her new husband. Um, and Joshua, Joshua Niles had an ongoing custody dispute with her. She would drive from Texas up to see the children there in New York and then drive back. But she never wanted to do it. She hated doing it. I mean, it's 1,600 miles. She could have, it would have been cheaper for her to fly. But, you know, some people like to drive. Washburn was uh, never even supposed to be at the, 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 where the shooting took place that day. Matter of fact, she was supposed to be out of town. The motive quickly, uh, um, when the police came and investigated the, the scene and everything else, they quickly zeroed in on, they had already you know, been called several times to uh, the home because of the custody issues. So the custody uh, issue became uh, the quick uh, number one motive for the entire uh, events. So, the um, so Charlene uh, Childress had the two children with Niles, um, Joshua Niles. She had moved on to Texas and had remarried, and she had um, fallen in love and married. Timothy Dean. Timothy Dean was at that time. He was just a, a, um, a he was a law enforcement officer. He was wasn't a detective. He was just a, a law enforcement officer. But he quickly raised up through the, the ranks to, um, within the small department that he was in, and became a uh, police chief. Everything seemed to be going great up until the point where a custody exchange turned wrong. And he was charged with one count of um, injury to a child, which was a felony. He took a plea uh, deal um, to the charge, and in exchange, they sealed the case for 10 years. But Timothy Dean, the new husband of her, uh, Charlene uh, Childress, uh, he resigned. He had to resign from his position as chief uh, police police chief. There was no ends around it. 
he his law enforcement career was going to be over with. So, in short time, this Timothy Dean went from being an ex-police um, officer, three-time runner-up of Citizen of the Year in his community, two-time winner, was forced to resign from the police department after his conviction. Now, th I should also note that the case of uh, what and what happened in, with the child and Timothy Dean and with um, Childress, that entire case is sealed. There's no absolutely no way anybody knows of, um, what happened. It was sealed in family court, and the only ones that know are the judges, the judge, and the you know the actual plaintiff and defendant, which would be the state and the um, the defendant and uh, the attorneys in the case. There has been a ton of speculation in the community where this would take place, that you know, in Texas there, in the panhandle, that what he was actually charged with, what he did he do, and everything else. And it turns out the real truth is he didn't do anything at all. Nothing. He didn't, he was part of a custody exchange where the the two parents, Niles and Childress, uh, started to play tug of war with, um, you know, basically, you know, the child and fight over the child. And he didn't do anything to uh, stop them. And the child uh, was injured and they charged every single person there with the same crime. It wasn't actually him. So he... Timothy Dean went on from being a highly decorated police officer, along with Citizen of the Year, to being on trial for murder in this case. How fair of a trial can he really get within the community where he, this is all taking place? Because it has been the, um, the rumor mill there had been going strong for over a year before his trial I ever got to, you know, this case got to trial. So, th this is what the state of New York alleges against Timothy uh, Dean. One, he rented a car to go that him and his wife, um, you know, uh, children uh, got together and they were, uh, sh they decided that they hatched out a plan to kill um, Niles. That he then rented a car. Um, and then drove there to New York and um, confronted him, killed him, and Amber uh, it was, you know, Washburn was there, and she wasn't supposed to be even be there, but, she, you know, the you know, casualty of, of the situation, he shot and killed her. That's what the state's basic, uh, you know, outline is. You know, um... It should be noted that he had, he never actually rented a car. There's no car that was actually rented in his name. His friend, um, Timothy Dean's friend, um, Bron Bro, Bro, Broler, I think he's probably, how you pronounce his last name, Broler, um, actually rented him a car, but he uh, ended up crashing the car in Kansas. He never even made it to New York. So... Uh, Childress then got in her car and drove to Kansas where he had the accident and then uh, rented him another car and then he then drove to New York is what the state is alleging. Now, according to the GPS data, there's an error with the GPS system from the car that she rented him and it actually turned off after about 14 miles of him being on the road in Kansas. So there is no GPS data from him being in Kansas to New York. There's no GPS data. Uh, he did not have a cell phone with him. He, normally you would be able to ping a cell phone on, on a trip like that. But there was no cell phone data for them to look at. So um, placing him at the actual um, shooting is going to come down. The case is still ongoing, by the way. I should add that. Um, the is going to come down to the two eyewitness testimonies, Mrs. Thayer and another neighbor who is uh, uh, their name is not being released uh, for them information being able to uh, their testimony. Do, will the jury believe that they saw this gentleman 
you know, uh, Timothy Dean, and they saw him from approximately 70 yards away from where the actual shooting took place. And remember, uh, Ms. Thayer looked out, glanced out her window in the kitchen across her yard. Then there's the driveway, and then there's a tree, and the conversation happened on the other side of a pickup truck. Oh, so she was looking over the top of the bed of a, of a Ford F-150 pickup truck, and she saw this gentleman with the hoodie. She said she did not see the, gentleman, the shooter's face when he was looking, you know, when the actual shooting of, you know, uh, Niles happened. But when he turned to the side, and shot uh, Amber is when they, she actually saw uh, the face. And that's the same thing with the neighbor who also said, yeah, that's the guy right there, you know, who, who did it. So it's a very interesting case. Um, the state admits that most of the, what the evidence that they have uh, against Timothy Dean is circumstantial. Um, and, but they are relying heavily on the eyewitness testimony. They are also relying on the fact that they believe that since he was chief of, you know, of police there um, in his community in Texas, that he had access to um, a handgun that wouldn't be able to be traced back to him because they take they took all of his service revol revolvers and all his personal guns and uh, ballistically none of those guns matched the gun that was used at the actual site at the crime scene. Did they catch him there? No. No, him, he was never caught there at the scene. Whoever the shooter was got back in the car and drove away. Now, um, that's another thing that should be noted is uh, Thayer and the, the other neighbor who uh, said that they witnessed this actual shooting, they both described the car that left the scene as a burgundy uh, four-door sedan. The original car that his, his friend um, Byron rented him was a burgundy car, but he crashed it in Kansas, and it was completely inoperable. I mean, from what I understand, he ran into the side of a uh, garbage truck. So it, it wasn't going anywhere, and it was there, and so there was no way for, you know, mileage-wise. And, and that same car, where the GPS uh, stopped working, the odometer, the entire electronics in the car turned off, and they can't restore it because it's computerized a lot of new cars are like that. They they don't have an actual physical odometer anymore. They have it's all computerized. And this car had an air with its you know odometer and its trip counter. All of it is is completely wiped out. And no, he couldn't have tampered with it because you had to have broken the seal on the back of the thing. And none of that has been tampered with. The police looked into all that. Oh, as you can see, I'm I'm still fighting this cold. I probably won't get this video uploaded until, um, well, later on, probably about another week from, from now, because I've got a bunch of videos that I'm, I'm finishing up in the meantime that I'll probably get up before this one, but this head cold and flu is just driving me and my family nuts. Oh, I am sorry for ranting there, but thank you everyone for stopping by and checking out the video today. And uh, you stay safe out there. I'm going to do a, probably a, a part two of this one, um, you know, uh, hopefully the day after I get this one uploaded. So we can, we can you know, at, like I said, the case is still ongoing. And we'll find out where, where this case is going to end up.